does your drinking water come from? Where does it go? What happens to it before it gets to you? Now, as your Savannah River Keeper, that's a question that I've asked hundreds, if not thousands of times throughout the years, and the answers are as varied as the people that I get to deal with. Sometimes I hear the sink, the ocean, the sky, dinosaurs. <laughs> well, for most of us in the room, the answer is the Savannah River, a river that supplies 1.5 million people with its drinking water every single day. It goes through three large lakes, reservoirs, is shared between two states, has 48 industrial and municipal outfalls, has the first nuclear power plant to expand in 38 years. It's the home of the atomic bomb and all the relic contamination that goes along with it, and the third largest port in the United States. So, your drinking water gets around a lot. I get asked all of the time, what is the single largest issue facing the Savannah River? The answer is simple, lack of awareness. Now why is that? Why don't we get it? Do we not understand that our drinking water comes from the Savannah River? Do we not understand that we need that water to thrive, that our economy needs it, that we need it for our health? What is it about water that we don't stay educated? What is it that keeps us from acting when we need to? Well, I think the answer is that for far too long, we've allowed water to be an environmental issue. And the cold, hard facts are environmental issues turn people off, a lot of people. But I'm your river keeper. My job is to get you to care about our water. So I don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. So over the last couple of years, we've developed a couple of tactics to try and combat these issues, to try to get people to pay attention, and to act. In 2016, we got a call at the office. Turns out there was a lady in rural Burke County, Georgia that had a notice on her front doorstep. That notice was for a survey that was coming through for a new pipeline. Now it turned out that pipeline was 360 miles long. It started in Belton, South Carolina, ran the parallel with the river, crossed in Augusta, parallel on the Georgia side, down to Savannah, along the Georgia coast, and into Jacksonville. Not only was it gonna cross through the swamps and under the river, the Savannah, but the other five great coastal rivers in Georgia. They made it very clear from the very beginning that if the landowners didn't wanna give the land, they were gonna take it. And they were going to do all of this in the names of saving money and creating jobs, both of which, by the way, turned out not to be true. So, oh, and the other thing that's fun is there was one of two hearings for the 360 long pipe mile pipeline, and it was next week. <laughs> so we did what we have done in Riverkeeper many times over because we looked. We have landowners that need help. We have the media. We have citizens that need answers. We have a river that needs us. We went into crisis mode. Crisis mode for us means, one, trying to figure out what in the world are we dealing with. In this instance, that meant trying to become an expert in petroleum pipelines in one week. Is there something that we need to do about it? And if so, how are we going to get there? So for us, the answer usually is coalition building and communications. And we've developed some rules that we try to follow. Number one, meeting people where they are and speaking in their value set. Chances are you've heard of love languages, right? This is how you're supposed to speak to your spouse to get them to understand, to get them to connect. I am a acts of service person. Maybe you are a gift giver or a words of affirmation. Look it up. It's the same thing here. You have to speak to people in a value set that they understand. I'll give you an example. Traditional river speak. The rivers must be free flowing for all of the birds and the fish, right? The spotted owl and the darter are more important than everything else. Climate change is real. Now what about the other 90%, the ones that are worried about the economy? over the birds. They're worried about their jobs over the spotted owl, their children over the fish. Well, we don't have a choice. We have to connect with those people. So what we found is by adapting our language just a little bit, by using 
words slightly differently, we can get people to connect. I'll give you an example. Fishing. Chances are maybe that made you think of a time that you were with your grandfather sitting at the ocean or on a lake in a hot summer day, and you were catching more family history than you were anything on your line. Birding. Maybe that makes you think of the first cardinal that shows up in spring, reminds you of a friend that you lost in the past coming to say hello, or the fact that winter is almost over, spring is on its way. Drinking from the faucet, or not, if you were here after Hurricane Matthew and the water wasn't running. Or imagine turning it on one day and it's salty. So we had a problem, a big problem. We had a 360 mile long pipeline, a hearing in a week, and we had to get people to pay attention really quickly. So we decided to do what we've done many times in the past, and that is focus on the one issue first at hand, and that was property rights. So we decided at the very beginning to let the land run and let the river take a back seat. The second thing, focus on your similarities and not your differences, right? So I'll give you a, a good example. This is, this is a hard one because it requires you putting your ego to the side and letting go of words that mean a lot to you. A good example for me would be environmentalism, environmentalists, climate change, global warming. Now, do I believe that we need to stop petroleum pipelines from expanding in the United States because we have to stop our reliance on fossil fuel? And if we don't, we're going to burn the damn earth up? Yes, I do. But one, my job was not to solve climate change. It was to protect my river. And two, the people that needed us, the people that we needed, didn't necessarily believe in climate change. So what did we do? We focused on the one thing that we all had in common, the land. The landowners didn't want it, right? The only people that wanted to take the land was the oil company. The landowners, they didn't want it because they want to keep their land. The competing oil companies didn't want it because to be honest with you, it's an unfair business practice that they, a tool they didn't get to use. That's an unfair economic advantage. And the third was citizens because it is just downright un-American to take somebody's land and give it to a private company for private profit. So we stuck to the one thing that we had in common, no eminent domain for private gain, and we ran with it. Now, a word of advice. When you are creating your coalition, if you look around and everybody in that coalition thinks the exact same way that you do, you have an echo chamber not a coalition, and you've lost touch. The third thing is to take non-traditional, your non-traditional partners and amplify your collective message through their voice. Make position makers that are not you. Put yourself in the back seat if it's required. I'll give you a good example. If anybody's interested, I could talk about the economics of the oil industry for way longer than I care to think about, but it sounds a lot better if it's coming from an oil executive, right? The main way that you focus on your similarity is focus on that one message. Slightly adapt it. No eminent domain for private gain. It's not needed. We don't want it. It's not worth the risk. Kind of like the time that a large landowner slash media mogul, a small homegrown oil company and a group of river keepers banded together, took on the largest pipeline company in the world and stopped the project in its tracks. The other thing that you have to do is focus on your similarities collectively and do not let others focus on your differences. I must have asked, answered the question a hundred times from the media, why this weird group of people? Why this non-traditional group? I answered that question in the exact same way every single time. It wasn't a weird group. It wasn't a non-traditional group or the wrong ones. It was exactly the right ones. So today, the Palmetto Pipeline is no longer a project. It no longer exists. But the coalition that came together not only stopped a pipeline, but we changed the law in South Carolina and Georgia, greatly strengthening the eminent domain laws, greatly strengthening the environmental oversight. What we did together was take the power back and give it to the landowners and the people. 
We did that by focusing on people's value sets, the value sets of the folks that needed us and that we needed, and catering our message to them. And we always worked with the non-traditional partners. We always have. And we get over the fact that we won't always agree. And I'll tell you one thing that we've found over the years is the more that we focus on our similarities, we find out that those differences aren't nearly as different as we thought. So at Riverkeeper, by using these over the years, we have found that we bring more people together that enables not only more short-term success, but it also greatly sets the stage for the paradigm shift that will greatly protect the river in the future and get everybody to start paying attention. So, good news, it's now your turn. So, I want you to get out there, work with your neighbors, work with your friends, damn your differences. It's not always going to be easy, it's not always going to be fun, but I can promise you one thing, it will be exciting and together, you just might find that you win. Thank you.